Good morning, everybody. It's a great privilege to be with you today. And I bring you greetings all the way from London. And the weather isn't a great deal of uh, uh, change, different from, from London. But um, yeah, it's pretty chilly up here, isn't it? <laughs> so, I'd like to um, speak to you this morning uh, about Jesus, our better high priest. Uh, but before I speak, let's pray. Father, we do uh, thank you for your goodness and your love towards us through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for your word that is able to equip us uh, for everything that we need for life and ministry. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through your word this morning and that, Lord, you bring glory and honor to your name. Uh, through Jesus our Lord, I pray. Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles uh, with you, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, from verse 14, Hebrews chapter 4. You know, uh, Hebrews is the one book in the Bible that teaches us that all men should make the tea. Hebrews. <laughs> Sorry, terrible joke. Hebrews 4, 14 to verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 10. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God, in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided, since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins, as for the people, so also for himself. And no one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another passage, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Well, in uh, October, the Jewish people marked Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, the most solemn of all the Jewish high holidays. And on this day, even non-observant Jewish people will often fast, attend synagogue, and pray long prayers of confession of sin in the hope that by the end of the day, God has heard and forgiven and inscribe their names in the book of life for one more year. There's only one problem. They have no high priest whose role was to represent the people before God as their mediator in order to make atonement for their sin. Aaron was the first high priest appointed by God and all future priests were to be descended from him. In Exodus chapter 28, Moses was commanded by God to make a plate of pure gold to place upon Aaron's turban engraved with the words Kodesh la Yahweh, holy to the Lord. And upon his shoulders were two onyx stones engraved with the twelve tribes of Israel. And he wore a dazzling ephod adorned with the twelve gems, each also engraved with the twelve tribes. He was Israel's representative and mediator before their holy God. He was to bear their sin by offering sacrifices and prayers on their behalf. And the high priest was the only person in the entire nation to enter the very presence of God behind the veil of the, of the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies, later on the temple. And even then, he could only enter one day a year on the Day of Atonement, when he took the blood of a sacrifice to appease God's wrath against sin. But today, Judaism has no one to offer the prescribed sacrifice for sin. No one to go into the Holy of Holies in the temple with blood to make atonement. In fact, for 2,000 years, 
there's been no temple, no altar, no sacrifice, and no high priest. And after the sanctuary was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70, Judaism changed from a sacrificial-based religion to one in which atonement was made, uh, in, in, one, in which one was uh, where atonement was made by the shedding of blood and the mediation of the high priest. Instead, it morphed into a religion which denied the need for a blood sacrifice and a mediator before God. And this gives modern Judaism a major problem as far as the author of Hebrews is concerned. Because in Hebrews 9.22, the writer says, According to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So why was blood so necessary? Well, Paul reminds us in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. Adam and Eve died spiritually and eventually physically after they disobeyed God. And the same is true for every human being ever since because we've all inherited Adam's fallen nature which alienates us from God. And in God's supreme justice, as the penalty for our rebellion is death, an innocent substitute must die to take our place and to pay the price for our sin if we are to know peace with him. And on Yom Kippur, that substitute was a goat. The high priest would lay his hands on the, on the head of the animal and confess the sins of Israel over the animal and transferring the guilt of the nation onto it. And the goat was then slaughtered, thus demonstrating the principle that sin brings death. But it was its blood sprinkled on the mercy seat in the Ark of the Covenant, on the Ark of the Covenant, that brought atonement. But why its blood? Well, Moses tells us in Leviticus 17, verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. So it's through the death of an innocent and the shedding of blood that atonement for sin was made. It was covered over in God's mercy. But this sacrifice on the Day of Atonement had to be repeated year after year, thereby reminding people of their sins. But the blood of Jesus, our supreme high priest, is infinitely better than the blood of any goat. The goat was an innocent animal, but it can never be a true substitute for a human soul. Hebrews 9, 11 to 12 says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Jesus, the sinless, blameless Son of God, took on flesh, to become one of us. He alone lived a perfect life. There was no fault in him. He alone could become the true Lamb of God to take our place and pay for our sin once and for all. He obtained for us an eternal redemption. You know, the animal sacrifices, of course, were just a shadow of what was to come. Jesus entered the holy place, not in an earthly tabernacle, but in heaven itself, and not with goat's blood, but with his very own to bring us peace with God. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, the New Testament writers revealed that this was no ordinary death. Jesus was dying in our place as the ultimate substitute that all the animal sacrifices pointed to. His death was of such magnitude and his blood so precious that there would be no need for a high priest to offer up goat's blood in the temple any longer. And that's why God allowed to be, the temple to be destroyed 2,000 years ago. The final sacrifice had been offered to end all sacrifices. Instead of sins being temporarily covered on Yom Kippur, the blood of the Messiah would remove our sin as far as the east is from the west, permanently. On the, the Day of Atonement, the high priest changed his clothes from his colourful robe and his uh, dazzling ephod of gems into a plain white robe before he entered the presence of God behind the veil of the Holy of Holies. Now that white robe may represent purity, but the veins of the high priest still flowed with sinful blood. 
No change in his outward appearance could change his inner sinful state. And that's why the first thing the high priest had to do before entering uh, the Holy of Holies to make atonement for the people, he had to sacrifice a bull to make atonement for his own sins. Aaron's white robe ultimately points to our need for a perfect, blameless, heavenly high priest. Jesus' blood was pure. His blood was sinless. His blood flowed for you and for me so that all of our impurities could be washed away so that we could stand before God, unashamed, wearing our own white robes of righteousness. Maybe you're sat here this morning conscious of your own sin that is staining your soul. Maybe you've tried your hardest to be clean, but time and time again you're sullied by the world and by your own sinful nature. But if that is you this morning, there is good news. The Bible says that we have a high priest in heaven who shed his blood for you to set you free. The blood of Jesus is more powerful than we can ever imagine. And it's quite ironic, isn't it, that we would never think of using blood to cleanse anything. <laughs> if you get a cut and you bleed on your clothing, uh, it's, it's a nightmare to get out, isn't it? But the stain of our sin has only one remedy, the blood of our high priest. And there's only one way to receive that cleansing. We must come to Jesus with empty hands. We've got to forget our homemade remedies. We need a heavenly stain remover. Only the blood of Jesus can reach our deepest shame and remove it once and for all. 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, if we walk in the light, as John says a couple of verses earlier, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So the blood of Jesus, our high priest, speaks better than that of Aaron's or the sacrifices that he offered. But the role of the high priest was not only to atone, atone for the people's sins, he was to intercede for them as their representative. And here we see how the prayers of our great high priest is also so much better than Aaron's. Why? Well, the priests were still human. They needed to sleep. They needed to eat. They needed to do everything that normal people did, such as look after their families and, and their wives. And they couldn't pray continually. Sooner or later, they died. Nor could they pray perfectly. Uh, the Apostle Paul, who no doubt he was a man of prayer, he acknowledges in Romans 8, 26 that we do not know what we ought to pray for. I mean, how often have you got down to prayer with the very best intentions, only to find your mind wandering onto what you're going to have for dinner? Guilty. <laughs> but as our great high priest, Hebrews 7.25 says that Jesus always lives to make intercession for us. He ever lives. He's the eternal Son of God. And he is for us. He is continually praying on our behalf that we would stand firm in our faith. How wonderful is that? Do you often shy away from God's presence because you feel guilty? Maybe you picture uh, God like an angry school teacher, hopefully not like a teacher here, that you've upset uh, one too many times. Look to Jesus. Look to the one who shed his blood for you. Look to the one who was raised from the dead, ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God interceding for you, day and night, perfectly. He knows how to uphold you, even in your greatest temptations. He's the only one who fully understands everything that you go through. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You can bear your soul to Jesus, the one who is more sorely tempted than we will ever know. I mean, if you go out, I don't know if you've ever done a 40-day fast. I haven't. But if you go without 40 days, you're going to be pretty weak, uh, 40 days without, without food. And after 40 days of fasting, Jesus was not only hungry and weak, but he, he faced a full frontal attack from the devil, trying to tempt him to sin. 
And Satan failed. But Jesus' greatest trial in the Garden of Gethsemane was to drink the cup of God's wrath for you and for me. He cried out for that cup to be taken from him, but he submitted to his Father's will. Not my will be done, but yours. Our Savior knows what it is to suffer the deepest pain as he sweat drops of blood from anguish in that garden. Do you suffer from being lonely or rejected? Jesus understands. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cried from the cross, naked, bleeding, cruel nails piercing his hands and feet, beaten half to death as his Father in heaven turned his face away from his own son. Is it possible to conceive of a greater agony than what Jesus went through when he bore our sins, severing his relationship with his Father in heaven? You know, you can bring your hurt and your pain to our great high priest. There's nothing he can't deal with. Allow him to comfort you and heal you as you pour out your heart to him. And why did Jesus go to the cross? Hebrews 12, 2 says it was for the joy set before him. The joy from the prospect that people like you and me would be with him for eternity. He gained the victory over, the, over sin, over the world and the devil, so that we too may overcome. He now reigns victoriously at God's right hand, standing in our defense and praying for us. No wonder the writer of Hebrews proclaimed that we can draw near to God's presence, even with confidence. No matter what shame we may feel about our sin, we can even draw near to this throne of grace with confidence, with full assurance. There is grace, there is mercy in abundance. Like a spring that never dries up, God's favor, his forgiveness, his love flows continually from and through our high priests in heaven. He's always there to help you in times of need. He never needs to sleep. <laughs> he never gets distracted by other things. Day or night, you can come to him with all of your temptations and all of your burdens and find the strength that you need in him. And even when we struggle to find the words to pray, be encouraged. He's our great intercessor. He's praying for us day and night before the throne of God. So Jesus, our high priest, has cleansed us with better blood, he, and he offers better prayers. And he also gives us a better hope. Hebrews 6, 14 to 20. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. God is a promise-keeping God. When he makes an oath, like he did with Abraham and swore by himself, the great patriarch of the Jewish people could be sure that God would do what he said he would do. Read the Old Testament and witness the faithfulness of the Lord towards his chosen people. Yes, they, would, they failed over and over, just as we have. But God swore that his blessing would never be removed from Abraham's descendants, and history shows this to be true. No matter how many times they faced persecution, and to our shame, often by the church, the Jewish people continue to thrive. God keeps his promises. How different we are. <laughs> How many times have you broken your word? How many times have I broken my word? How many times have people let you down? Maybe they've promised you something and they've, they've broken their word. It's easy to lose trust 
in people altogether sometimes. Maybe you even allowed yourself to cast doubt on the Word of God itself. If, if people can let you down so much, can we really trust the Bible? Will, is God like other people who will break His promises? Can we really believe that they will come true? Well, the writer of Hebrews proclaims a resounding yes. He says, the promise and the, and the hope we have in Jesus is so sure it is like an anchor for our soul. In calm waters, ships don't need an anchor. It's only when weather conditions become dangerous that it becomes essential. So when a gale is blowing and a, and a ship can't hold its course and risks being driven aground uh, on, a, on a rocky coast, then an anchor is worth its weight in gold. Of course, life is full of storms. Satan tempts us, our, ho our, our human weakness besets us, the trials of this life break upon us like waves. But God has given us a means to be saved from life shipwrecks. He's provided an anchor, an anchor so sure that no storm can overwhelm us. Jesus is that sure and steadfast anchor. The only one who went through the veil of the Holy of Holies in heaven on our behalf to bring us peace with God. Because he overcame our sin, the world, and the devil, he is able to give hope to everyone who believes in him. Hope that takes us through the most difficult times of life, whether that's sickness, unemployment, relationship breakup, Jesus is that anchor you need to ride through the storm. But our ultimate hope is that of eternal life. Because he is our high priest who shed his blood for us and stands in our defense in the very presence of God as our mediator, he purchased an eternal salvation for all those who trust in him. Hebrews 6 verse 20 tells us that Jesus is our forerunner. Sailors would often carry a ship's anchor ahead in a smaller boat in order to secure it to um, a, a more a secure point to anchor the anchor, <laughs> to attach the anchor as solidly as possible. And as the forerunner for our souls, Jesus has blazed the trail into heaven and he has secured our salvation. He has gone ahead of us. He has made a way. He has secured our salvation. An anchor in heaven that can never be dislodged. How about you this morning? Do you, do you have that anchor for your soul today? Now I know I'm, I'm talking to theological students, um, but I, I, I haven't met you before. I, I don't know you. And, uh, but one thing I do know, when I, when I study theology myself, I had question marks even over a couple of my lecturers, whether they were uh, saved or not. But uh, one thing I've, I've learned, it's possible to know the Bible back to front. It's possible to read all the theological books in the world and still know only about Jesus and not know Jesus. So what I would say to you is that even if you have some doubt in your mind today, whether you know Jesus, take uh, some time to think about that question. Have you received him? Have you trusted in him for the forgiveness of your sins? Only those who have done that can truly know peace with God. Finally, the writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is a better high priest than Aaron because he is a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Who on earth is Melchizedek, and why does that make Jesus better than Aaron, I hear you ask. And by the way, does anybody know it, have any friends called Melchizedek? If you, if you don't, if I ever have a child, if I have a son... Oh, really? Oh, it's going to be the first one. That's a shame. I was hoping to be the first person ever to call my child Mel Melchizedek. <laughs> well, this mysterious character is found in Genesis chapter 14, where he's described as the king priest of Salem, later known as Jerusalem. Abraham was blessed, after, blessed by him after returning from a rescue mission to save his nephew Lot, and Abraham responds to Melchizedek's blessing by uh, giving tithes to him, and that's pretty much all we know about this guy. And some people think he was a pre-incarnate Christ, uh, but I think that's doubtful. But what is significant about Melchizedek is what he stands for. No genealogy is given for him, which Hebrews chapter 7 says represents timelessness. 
and his name means king of righteousness. So here we have a king of righteousness who is also a priest who symbolically lived forever. Well, Jesus is our eternal high priest who died, rose again, and lives forever, but he is also our king, as Psalm 110 wonderfully foretells. As Alistair pointed out earlier, the most frequently quoted psalm in all of the New Testament referring to Jesus. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power, in holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. This amazing prophetic psalm teaches us that Jesus, our great high priest, is also our great king. He is our king of righteousness, who has not only purchased forgiveness for us by his blood, upholds us by his intercession, and gives us hope as the anchor for our soul, he is also our king priest in the order of Melchizedek, who will return and reign victoriously over all the enemies of God. Now, since they were from different tribes, the priesthood of Aaron could never function as a king, and the king of Israel could never function as a priest. There were dire consequences if he tried, as showed by King Uzziah, who tried to offer a sacrifice, and he was struck by leprosy by the Lord. But Jesus perfectly combines these two offices as our great high priest, as our perfect mediator, and our king of righteousness, who will return and reign over all the kingdoms of the earth, as Psalm 110 foretells. To close, the Aaronic priesthood was a wonderful ministry that sustained the spiritual life of the Jewish people for hundreds of years by offering sacrifices and acting as a mediator between the people and their God. But the priesthood was always meant to point the people to a need for a better high priest the Son of God, who would take on human flesh and deal with the problem of sin once and for all. No human being can ever come close to what Jesus did for us on the cross, what he does for us even now as our high priest in heaven, and what he will do for us in the future when he returns as the King of Kings. He alone deserves our obedience, our worship, and our love. And as we come to him, let us remember his own Jewish people, that they would too also know him as their high priest and their king. Let's pray. My Lord Jesus, we do um, thank you so much that you are our great high priest in heaven. We thank you, Lord, that you came in the fullness of time. You took on flesh. You humbled yourself. You, you gave up everything it was to be God, to become the Lamb of God. To, to be uh, our sacrifice of atonement that would bring forgiveness for us once and for all, permanently, through your blood. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you rose from the dead, having completed the job of salvation, and you reign in heaven now, and you are interceding for us as our great priest. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to the throne of grace, even with full assurance, even with all of our sin, all of our failures, all of our disappointments, all of our temptations and our burdens, we can come to you and know that you are for us and not against us. And we thank you, Lord, that as we cling on to you, as our uh, anchor for our soul, we thank you, Lord, that you can never fail us and that you have purchased for us an eternal salvation, not a temporary one. And I thank you, Lord, for this wonderful and glorious hope that you are returning as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and all the kingdoms of the earth will become the, kingdoms, the kingdom of our Lord and our Saviour. And Lord, we do continue to pray for the Jewish people. And we pray, Father, that uh, with uh, Yom Kippur last month, 
that they would realize that their atonement cannot come just by them approaching you in their own way, but that they need the blood of a sacrifice. They need the blood of the Messiah, the only one who has dealt with the problem of sin. So Lord, we pray for the Jewish people today that they would come to know you as their priest and their king. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you very much indeed, Philip, for taking us through that passage of Scripture and highlighting important themes for us to, to reflect on as we go through this day, focusing on mission to the Jewish people. Uh, we sang a little earlier uh, from uh, a Psalm book um, from Psalm 110, and we're going to continue now. We've had one or two folks uh, join us, and you're very welcome indeed. If you don't have a Psalm book, could you just, just put your hand up, please, so that... Uh, we can make sure that you get one, and my colleague John Angus has some that he'll make available to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, John Angus. So, uh, we began singing Psalm 110 verses 1 to 4. Uh, we're going to uh, finish this time of worship from the singing from the final three verses. That's on page 150. Page 150 of this psalm book, uh, a metrical version of the psalms. Uh, and so uh, the Lord, in verse 4, swore to uh, his anointed, just like Melchizedek, you are a priest forevermore. And then the psalm continues, the Lord's at your right hand. There he will ever stay. He on his day of wrath will crush the kings who bar his way. So we'll sing verses 5 to 7 of Psalm 110, page 150, and we'll stand as we sing. Now, since Philip was very diligent in uh, keeping to his time, uh, we have a few minutes before we're scheduled to begin the next session. So, what I thought I would do and introduce their organization uh, to you. Um, Richard should feel absolutely free if I ask a question to say I'm going to speak about that later. Uh, but uh, would you gentlemen come up just for a moment and I'll ask you a couple of questions. So, Welcome once again. Uh, so we have Richard Gibson, uh, Director of Mission, for those who have uh, joined us, of uh, Christian Witness to Israel, and then Philip Amos, who is a missionary based in London uh, with CWI. Richard, maybe I could start with you first of all. Can you tell us just a little bit about uh, Christian Witness to Israel, what it is, what it does? Sure. Well, uh, Christian Witness to Israel is uh, um, an international, interdenominational or non-denominational, however you want to say it, mission to the Jewish people that's founded uh, on Reformed theology. So that kind of is our distinctive in the, uh, in the smorgasbord of uh, Jewish missionary organization. That marks us as uh, quite distinct. Um, and so we've, uh, and I'll mention this in the lecture, 177 years old, lots of connections with the, the Free Church of Scotland in our founding. And uh, we are based in Oxford, that's where our head office is, um, but uh, we'll be wherever there is Jewish people. So our name, Christian Witness to Israel, 
the Israel in our name means the people of Israel, not necessarily the state of Israel. So whilst we do have missionaries in Israel, it's not limited to, to that one country. It's wherever the people of Israel are found. Thank you very much. Um, Philip, maybe I can ask you, can you tell us a little bit about how you came to be involved in uh, Jewish mission? Sure. Well, I had a, a, a passion for uh, evangelism, I guess, from when I first became a Christian, uh, about 20 years ago. And um, I sensed quite early on that I had a, some sort of calling to go into the ministry. I just didn't know what. So I ended up doing, a, uh, my first degree was, it was in science and ecology. So I ended up doing a second course in theology. But, um, you know, God's timing is often different from ours. And uh, for, I think it was like 14 years, I was mainly working with homeless people. Uh, and local authorities. But, um, but whatever job I was doing, I always, always felt like a square peg in a round hole. And, um, and then when I moved to Oxford for work, um, I felt the Lord speaking to me uh, through missionaries I just kept on bumping into in these different churches I was involved with at the time. And um, it happened three times over the course of about three weeks. And I felt a bit like Samuel in the temple when you know, he was called three times by the Lord. And uh, so I started to push doors. And then I heard about um, Christian Witness to Israel. Uh, Joseph Steinberg, who's the chief exec, he's a Jewish believer himself. He was uh, being in inaugurated in Oxford. And uh, I was really inspired by his vision for Jewish mission. And it really resonated with me. And I really, I, I had an understanding of the Bible from a Jewish perspective. And I understood that verses like Romans 1.16, that there is, a, there is a priority. There's an urgent need to reach Jewish people with the gospel. And, um, and so I had a chat with him afterwards, and he really encouraged me. Uh, and it was really a combination of throwing myself into the work um, through sort of volunteering in uh, home and abroad in London, uh, Budapest, Amsterdam, and also learning about Judaism. So I started going along to a synagogue in, in Oxford, something called Chabad, which is a, an Orthodox synagogue, befriending um, Jewish people there. One particular guy who was able to share my faith with. Um, but to be honest, uh, even after I went through all that process and working with my local church and assessing the call and eventually getting the all clear to apply and, and I got the job, um, even then I still felt completely like, is this God? I feel unworthy, I feel inadequate, is this just me pushing ahead? And I was um, in Amsterdam and, uh, with, with, the, with our outreach there and I, and I was just praying for particular encounters with Jewish people that God would confirm it. And, uh, and he really did give me some, some special encounters with Jewish people. Uh, but one in particular really encouraged me that there are Jewish people out there who want to know about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And this uh, particular encounter, I was, it wasn't even on the streets. It was back in the hotel. It was about 11 o'clock at night. I was playing some pinball. And this young lad came up to me, wanted to join in, and I let him release the balls. And, um, and then his, his dad joined us. He introduces himself as a, as a Jewish man from Tel Aviv in Israel. He said he's on holiday there with his family. And then he asked me why I'm there. And I said, okay, well, uh, well I'm here to talk to people about Jesus. And he asked me a question which uh, I, I've never heard before or since. He said, tell me everything you know about Jesus. <laughs> For the next two hours, I was there in the hotel lobby until like 1 a.m., going over as many Messianic prophecies as I could remember. And he was following in Hebrew on his phone, stuff he'd never heard before. And he was quite taken aback, and he was like, wow, I'm going to have to check with my rabbi about these things. But that really encouraged me that there are Jewish people out there who want to know about Jesus. And it was, felt like a special sign for me to, that, that this is, you know, I'm on the right track. Um, yeah, and I started April last year. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So you're, uh, you're quite new to the organization, uh, but uh, already it sounds like there are encouragements there. Uh, Richard, uh, just a, um, a final question for you. You are Director of Ministry. You've been with CWI for quite some time, I gather. Yes. Um, can you just tell us one or two of the things that have been particularly striking about your experience with the organization, perhaps things that have particularly encouraged you or things that have impressed you about the need that exists? Um, so perhaps just something that has encouraged you in your, in your time with CWI. Well, I can reflect back on nearly 30 years of working with CWI. I was saying to you earlier on, I've uh, gone through four CEOs and three head offices. Um, so I've seen a fair bit of change in, in CWI, but the thing that has changed the most is the level of interest that we're encountering with, with Jewish people. Um, so 30 years ago, you'd be hard pressed to meet Jewish people who named the name of Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Now, 
It's not unusual. Mm. It's quite common. And the willingness of people to speak and to seriously engage is at a is unprecedented uh, level in, in, in our contemporary uh, situation. So that's the greatest encouragement mm. for me in this last 30 years, quite how many people are willing to talk, but the number of people that are coming to mm. faith is really quite interesting, quite encouraging. Great. And I will reflect a little bit about that later on. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Since we're going to make you work hard for the rest of the day, I think I'll, I'll pause there. Um, but So please uh, feel free to have a seat.